Hello everybody and welcome back to the Tornaries podcast. I'm James Leonard and as always I'm joined by Timmy. Hi um, everyone. Happy Sunday morning. Um, and this week we've got a guest from County Wexford, Mick O'Brien. Great to be here James. Thanks for having us and Timmy, lovely Thank to you. meet you as well. Thanks for, thanks for coming down. Not for those people that don't know who you are, can you tell us who you are, where you're from and where you grew up? So uh, Mick O'Brien, I am uh, I suppose have many different hats in, in my life. Um, First of all, I'm a, I'm the front man of a, a fairly well-known folk band called The Druids. Um, secondly, I work as a lecturer in Minute University, lecturing in, in, uh, on the youth work course. Um, father to three sons as well. Um, the toughest gig on the planet. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I also present a radio show in Dublin on Dublin City FM for the last 22 years called Shin Aids and Irish Folk Music radio show they tell me it's the longest running Irish folk radio show in the world so um, I also do that as well and then uh, in the middle of all that I try and stay clean and sober as well Brilliant. Did, where do you find all the time to do all that <laughs> I don't know I, I suppose over the years I've kind of um, I've managed to kind of create little pockets of time to do yeah. various different things um, I like keeping myself busy I like variety as well I really like variety you know um, so I suppose anything I do in my life, I like it. Because if I don't like it, I don't do it. It's as simple as that, you know? Mm. So that's a philosophy that I have. And you're from Wexford? Yeah, I'm from Wexford, yeah. Um, and you said you're in recovery. Oh, yeah. Would you want to tell us a little bit about your addiction and how you got into addiction and what, what the addiction was? And Yeah. I think um, I was just thinking on the way down here today... Um, this podcast is a different gig for me. It's a different. Uh, it's a different uh, way of telling stories. I'm. I'm quite used to doing interviews on TV and radio across America and podcasts and whatever. And very easy to talk about music and very easy to talk about history and the band and stuff. Mm. Uh, but this is a different gig altogether. Talking about myself. Um, so I grew up in Wexford. I was born in Wales. Cardiff and Wales, two parents had emigrated uh, in the 1960s. Um, like during, many? Yeah, like so many is right. During the economic recession, um, I think I was about six months old when I came back to Wexford. Um, and uh, we moved into a, a mobile home at the back of my aunt's house, uh, which would have been quite common in them days as well. Um, a few years after that, we got a council house um, in a place called Ballycanew. A really interesting place, uh, about maybe four miles from Courthown, the, the well-known kind of holiday resort at that time. Um, so I grew up about four miles from the beach. In many ways, it was a kind of fairly idyllic setting, a little country village. Um, and if you just drove through it, you know, it's just that's a lovely place to be, you know. And the beaches in Wexford are hard to beat. Absolutely, they are hard to beat, you know. Um, but there was an undercurrent in the, in, the, in the community. Really, what happened in 1976... Uh, the government started rolling out a social a social housing building program, and uh, this council house council housing estate was built in this little quaint village. Now, it wasn't wanted; uh, the locals didn't want it there, um, and there was a stigma that came with growing up in this estate. and And I was one of the people that grew up in this estate, so from as far back as I can remember. You know, we kind of always... I, I had that feeling that I didn't belong, that I didn't fit in, that you weren't wanted. Um, I'd go to school with, with kids who were being dropped off in BMWs and Mercs, and um, we'd hardly shoes on our feet. Do you know mm. what I mean? So there was a huge divide and a huge kind of class distinction that, that existed there at that time. And did you feel that as a young person? Oh, very much so, James. Um, I wouldn't have been able to consciously understand what it was, but I knew we were different, you know, and I knew we were treated different. Even the application of education was different for people like me, you know. Um, in primary school, um, you know, there was favouritism there. There was, uh, we were kind of seen as the, the kind of riffraff, the scum that kind of came down from the housing estate. I, I think, think because um, you were from a council estate, there was less expected of you compared to the kids that were from yeah. affluent areas. There was actually nothing expected of us, to be honest. There really wasn't, you know. If you think back as well, going into the 1980s, we were in another major economic recession. Mm -hmm. Emigration was very prevalent at the time. Um, and I remember in sixth class, actually in school, in sixth class, the, we were coming in to the end of sixth class and then moving into secondary school. I remember the headmaster came in one day and he looked at some of us and he said to us... Um, Lads, if you get an opportunity of a job, I'd advise you to take it because there's not much point in you going on to 
to second level education, you know? It's like you were expected to get, like take the trade or yeah. Yeah. take the labourer's job in a building. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We can, uh, from where we come from, it's, it's the same. Yeah. Same view, really, isn't it, James? Yeah, yeah, well, you would hope that in certain in the schools, anyway, it'd be a bit better. But I remember when I was in secondary school, we were never there was, there was never any talk of CAO points or no, fucking no, no, Susie no, grants or no, anything like no, that. You know, no, I was just no. I, I uh, points for the leave insert. I'd say I got about eight. <laughs> <laughs> you done the leave insert, then? I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Fair play. You don't get any points for foundation. Yeah, I yeah, did a couple yeah. of foundation, but. Mm-hmm. We'd no yeah. mass in education, you know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. it was nothing expected of us. No. no certain classes in the in in the cl- in the school would have the, the the fellas that wanted to do well and the fellas that were good yes. academically. Yes. It was all about or UCC yeah. and CAT for them, mm-hmm. but then for the rest of us that had yeah. probably issues, um, or they'd, they'd be lucky enough to make it through mm-hmm. the year and they go into a trade or something. You know, like just if you were present was good enough. Like exactly. you know, yeah. The, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I I transferred into secondary school. Um, so the little village I grew up in, the the secondary school was six or seven miles away in Gorey, which was the, the the main town. So transferred into that. I think I, I don't think I even lasted six months in it. Um, and I left school. I left school at thirteen. Um, I was completely illiterate. I couldn't read or write. Um, mm-hmm. I had no concept of reading or, or writing. Although, looking back at it, my IQ was very high. Um, I was fairly intelligent. I could pick things up very well. I had a, a savage memory, you know. My memory was was just brilliant. Like I could uh, hear something once, and I'd remember it. Mm. You know, it actually came in very very handy for me as a, as a as a musician or singer. Then afterwards, just remembering songs and stuff like that. Words. Isn't of that songs. amazing? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Because your your memory was so good. Yeah. You know. That's I think what it was, Timmy, was that I had to remember things because I couldn't yeah. read them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my, my audio, my audio kind of um, memory was just brilliant, you know. Even today still, actually, to be honest, I can hear a song once or twice and I have it. I have the mm. lyrics in, in my head, you know. Um, but I left school thinking I was stupid, mm. thinking I was tick. I, I went into uh, first year and ended up in, in 1D. So 1A was the bright class, 1B, 1C and 1D. I ended up in 1D. And I remember we were... Uh, we were for in the same <laughs> club, so we were in the same <laughs> well, class. We did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I remember uh, we used to watch, watch this documentary. Uh, we didn't even get books. You know, they used to put on this documentary about coal miners in Wales. I was fascinated with it because I was born in Wales, you know. Um, and there were songs in the documentary, folk songs in it, that I really kind of warmed to as well. Mm. Uh, songs that were written by Frank Hennessy, songs that I know very well today, but I didn't know back then. Um, but that was like every week we watched this. We used to watch documentaries about lines in the Kalahari Desert, you know, uh, and that was the education that we got. And mm. So I legged it out of there as, as quickly as I could. And um, but Kind of into the addiction thing, um, my background, my family background... Um, I always knew there was something wrong in my family. Uh, I didn't know what it was as a child. I, 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 but I did know that the feeling that I got in some of my friends' house was different than what was in my house. Um, mm. There was a coldness in my house. There was a, there was an atmosphere when you walked in. Uh, there was no love in the house. There was no, there was no emotion in the house. Uh, I lived in a situation where both my parents, they either killed each other 24 hours a day, there'd be plates flying across the room, cups flying across the room, there'd be violence, uh, or there was complete silence. And the silence was worse than than the violence, to be honest. And the silence could go on for months and months. And you walked around on eggshells, uh, just waiting for it to erupt. Was there like, was there addiction in the home with your parents, or was it just... If you, if you would have asked me that question maybe 10 or 15 years ago, my answer would have been, James, that uh, my father was in recovery. Uh, he is... I think he's nearly 50 years clean and sober now at this stage. Um, but no recovery. Um, mm. And I would have said that my mother was a teetotaler. She never drank or smoked or anything. But memories have come back to me over, over the years. And the reality is that both my... Well, definitely my mother was completely out of it on prescription tablets. Um, it was the era of... Uh, Dizapan and mm. Valium and uh, like they were being my given, old friends. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, being given out like Smarties. You know, uh, yeah. I've memories myself of of her, you know, making me go to the doctor, you know, to pick up her prescription. 
Um, Known as the mother's little helper. Exactly, the mother's mm-hmm. little helper. Yeah. Like. yeah. Did you know with all them fights and arguments that were going on inside in the house? Because I, I, I'm thinking of my own story. You know, uh, would you have ever blamed yourself for any of the stuff that Big was time. going on? You Big know, time, because yeah. it's normal for a child to blame yeah. themselves when they see their parents arguing, mm-hmm. and it just ingrains a fear in the child yeah. then yeah. In, in their own lives. You know, my my one constant memory of my mother is this I was saying this to Mary here going back a couple of weeks ago I think um, is that my job in the house was on a Wednesday was to get uh, the money lender used to call on a Wednesday and uh, my job was to get to him before he got to the door because if he got to the door my father would know that she was after getting money off him and there would be blue murder in the house and I mean like there would it would be and a couple of times I didn't make it to him and he got to the door and then it was my fault, mm. do you know? Um, when you think about putting a child of seven or eight or nine mm. years of age in that situation, mm. um, no wonder I ended up the way I did then afterwards. Yeah. And, th- and that's mild. That kind of stuff is mild. The other thing about this is that, and again, you know, I only discovered this about 20 years ago. Uh, my mother had a secret, you know. Um, she had a child before she met my father. Uh, and it's interesting that we're talking about mother and baby homes and stuff like that currently. So she had a daughter uh, when she moved to Wales first, when she emigrated. The baby was born. And I think the baby was taken off her and was adopted in Scotland. And uh, she never told my father that. Uh, and she never told anybody, mm. nobody. Um, and again, like if I think about her, she's still alive. Um, I don't have any contact with her, but uh, but she's still alive. And I think about what she must have went through. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the pain of that, like. Mm. Um, That's very interesting because, you know, obviously in the last few weeks there the, there was the vote in the dial around yeah. the sealing documents for 30 right. years. But the reason that was done was because of the likes of people like your mother. Yeah. Does, and we had uh, somebody on as well a few weeks ago that has been through this as well um, mm-hmm. as a mother. Yeah. The, the, the adoptees want the records because they want to know who their parents are. Yeah. But a lot of the times, the mothers, they've moved on with their lives. Yeah. The husbands that they're with now, the kids that they've had afterwards, know nothing about that. Not and all. they yeah. want it left like that. That's right. So yeah. it's, this is a kind of um, a split, I suppose, between the mothers and the adoptees around mm. to release the documents, not release the documents. It's not as simple as oversealing the documents mm. just because it's because of people don't want that left behind yeah. and they've gone on with their lives afterwards yeah. and a lot of unspeakable traumas that their mothers went through and they don't want to you know so it's complicated Crazy. like isn't it it is very complicated very very complicated you said something there that i want to bring it back to you said your father was sober for a long time but he wasn't in recovery mm-hmm. will you explain that to, to, for us please because people equate yeah. sobriety that is recovery but it's not sure it's not yeah. no it's not uh, mm-hmm. he stopped drinking um uh, I, I don't know, was I, I was probably a year old uh, and uh, I, I have no memory of him drinking at all. Um, and he, But he stopped drinking and he started going to meetings. And um, he went to meetings for a few years and then he stopped going to meetings. But he didn't do anything else. Um, and I suppose the term dry drunk comes into play. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that people have to go to meetings. I'm not making any judgment at all on anything. But what I'm saying is that... You need to do some possible you, development. You have to do yeah. something. Like You have to do something. And he he actually, as well, he was in the Congo. He was he was in a, he was an army an army veteran. He was in the Congo in Cyprus. And he was in the Congo when the massacre happened. Mm. He was one of the soldiers there. I look at him today, you know, there's no, no question in my mind that he suffers from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I have a friend that you mm. know in Halley Hill. Yeah. Mm. Remember that father? He yeah. was in the Congo. I remember him telling me years and years ago, and, and it's the only one thing he ever told me about the car, about the, about the Congo is that uh, during an ambush uh, that happened, I think it, it could have been in uh, on the bridge in Nyamba, I think. I think that's the words that I remember. He talked about his friend being up in a tree and he was shot and he landed in his arms. Like that's movie stuff, that's yeah. television stuff, like you know what I mean? Yeah. But that actually happened to him, dead, yeah. do you know? Um, how do you come out of that? Like how do you how do you kind of get back into normal life and kind of try to try to deal with it without any sort of mm-hmm. treatment at all? So he was a, he, he's a lovely man. I've great time for him. Uh, and through all my life he stood he stood by me. Um in all the the fucking shit that I brought to the house and and 
all the traumatic events that I was involved in, he was the single person that was always there. When I was in court, I'd look down the courtroom, he was the person that was there. Mm -hmm. But the other side of him was that he was so unpredictable. You'd walk around in eggshells around. You don't know what you're getting. Even today, you don't know what you're getting. Do you mm -hmm. know? Uh, mood swings, kind of uh, very unsettled. Um, and people with post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. they can be triggered like that yeah. by mm -hmm. sounds and yeah. smells and yeah. sights and stuff. And yeah. that's where the erratic behaviour can come in then. That's right, yeah. So, um, so yeah, lack of recovery was, was very much present there at that time, you know. Um, I lived with a... As a child, I lived with, with this loneliness inside me and this fear that was constant, like I had a constant fear in me. Um, they're, the, they're the feelings that I can remember as a child. And, and one of them, one of that fear, one of those fears was that either my mother or father was going to leave, right? That I, I, this was an obsession that I had in my head for years and it came to pass. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what age I was, 11, maybe 10, 11, something like that. Maybe I could have been even younger. Um, I came home from school one day and she was gone and I didn't see her for 20 years after that just vanished gone um, that was one of the most traumatic experiences that I have ever experienced in my life um, even though to other people that might be a whole, a whole lot of time but for me that controlled the next 10-15 mm. years of my life that one event uh I suppose you were you were abandoned by your mother. Completely. You know, a lot of people can relate to being abandoned by their fathers. Yeah. You know, but there's a small percentage of, of, of children that are abandoned by their mothers as yeah. well. And so there's that nurturing feeling from the mother growing up and, and, and to be abandoned, feel abandoned. Yeah. I know quite a few men that have been abandoned by yeah. their mothers. And yeah. it's uh, a lot of... Yeah. The yeah. yeah. to deal with that and the father. Yeah, yeah. I remember neighbours, when that happened, like, again, close-knit community, 44 houses in this estate. Everybody knows your business. It, it, like, the shame of it mm. was unreal. Uh, neighbours, some of the women that lived next door to us or something, they'd be trying to look after you, you know what I mean? They'd be trying to see we okay. And every time somebody would mention her name, the tears would just yeah. come to my eyes. And, but I wouldn't let them out. Mm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let anybody see that, you know? Um, and uh, it's only, it's probably only over the last, you know, 10 years that I've actually dealt with that, you know what I mean? I was just about to ask you, how do you feel about that today when you're talking about it? I feel very sad about it, James. There's a sadness in me still about it. Um, I really feel sorry for her, you know? Like, I, I, I have another brother as well, an older brother who's two years older than me. And if, if you think about it, the three children that she's had, she abandoned the three of them. Mm. do you know mm. and I think about her now she's she must be about 77 78 years of age and I I wonder I often wonder how her head is you know when she wakes up in the morning Christmas well, time I wonder what's her story that life well, led her to abandon children she grew up in she grew up in in the famous Bowl of Oak which is a uh, famous uh, Irish history place 1798 rebellion started there yeah and her mother done exactly the same thing to her, um, which would be my grandmother, left the family home as well and abandoned her. So, you know, the understanding of why this happened, so what you see, you practice, what you practice, you become, and what you become, you teach. Mm. Um, but understanding, it's like, the, it's like the Titanic on its maiden voyage. Like the captain who was driving the Titanic knew he hit an iceberg, but it didn't stop it sinking. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So mm. understanding is just one part of it. Yeah. It's dealing with... With the with that abandonment and rejection, um, and you, there's still there's still part of that in me today. There's yeah. th there definitely is. Do you know what I mean? Have you came to a place in your life where um, you're able to forgive her? Have you yeah. gotten to that place? Like I have, Timmy. Because yeah, I, I know I know ex yeah. I exactly I understand exactly what you're talking about in terms yeah. of the mother situation. Like yeah. I would have had, you know, my mother was always there physically, like, but she would have suffered from mental health yeah. really badly as well. But she was the only parent that we would have had in the household growing up. Yeah. So she it wasn't like she could have just took off. She would have at times went into certain mental in institutions in, in to, to get herself sorted for yeah. a bit and then come back into the family home, you know. Um, but, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, 
it's something that like the things that would have happened in between that then while she was in and out of those places would have been stuff that really affected me yeah. in my own life and, and would have turn, uh, pushed me towards different addictions and yeah. stuff but um, as I got older then and I got into recovery and I was able to understand my mother's circumstances and why she was the way she was you know it was hard for me to forgive her and there was a lot of anger a lot a lot of anger and there was a lot of therapy and there was a lot of talking about the different situations and and like my mother committed suicide when myself and my two brothers were when we were in prison and Jesus. sorry to hear that not yeah it's 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 sad but um this this situation is like i, I was able to understand yeah. where she came from yeah. from understanding what she, what happened in her own life yeah. and the forgiveness came from that yeah. as well do you know i I have that today. Yeah, there's no, good. there's no doubt. I have that. I completely understand where she came from. I, I really feel sorry for her. I have a mm. lot of kind of sympathy for her, and I wish that things could be different for her. You know, um, but I'm not in control of it. Mm. I, 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 I have to look after my side of the street. I have to look yeah. after what's going on with me, because I, I dipped my toes back in there again, going back some years ago, and I got hurt again. Do you know? Mm. So it's kind of, I have to be careful around that. But I, first of all. I don't wish her any harm. Mm. I wish her actually well. I really do wish her well. And I hope, I really hope that she's found some happiness for herself. I really do, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Because there's a part of you will always want the acceptance yeah. of your mother. Even, it doesn't matter mm. if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever amount of therapy you're after doing. Yeah. You always, there's always that, yeah. like, will she accept me today? Will she accept yeah. me today? But yeah. you're always, like, the, you're gonna have. You just have to accept that. Yes. You know what? That's just the way she is. And uh, as you said yourself, you have no control over her. No. You can only mind yourself. That's in right. It. Mm-hmm. Before Christmas, there just before Christmas, I was going through a bit of stuff myself because of a a situation in my life. And it's funny, like I wanted to make contact with her. Do you know exactly what you said? Do you know? I I actually was on the verge of making contact with her. Um, for her to kind of mm. tell me everything would be going to be okay. And mm. do you know, like, I'm really glad I didn't know because mm. I would have been doing it for the wrong reasons. Do you know what I mean? And you probably would have been bound again. I think so. Mm. I think so, you know. Um, so I'd say you carried a lot of anger and resentment through your teenage years. Well, I suppose there was serious anger in me. I, I didn't realise it. I, I didn't know it. But... When this, when I discovered my, when I discovered alcohol, actually, my the first drug I ever take I ever took was a solvent. Um, I was about ten years, ten or eleven years old. Um, there was a guy who came into school to do an anti drugs workshop, and he demonstrated how to take solvents. <laughs> and I went and I went home and took them. And it's simple as that. Uh, I can still remember it. Uh, it was a can of Imperial Letter deodorant. And I can taste it right to this day. I know exactly what mm. I done. I know where I was. I was in the bedroom with my brother, mm. and we were at like t- the t- best t- melon bread and gory. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> like we were after getting these. Uh, I can remember we were after getting a present of a can of deodorant for Christmas. Right? We'd never. We didn't even know what fucking deodorant was. Do you know what I mean? But mm. we were after getting a can of this, and this fella demonstrated. He was saying like, "Don't do this," and he had a rag, and he had the, and. So I went home and I was stoned down my bin, like for mm. for the feeling though. The yeah. feeling the feeling yeah. was unbelievable. Like, mm. you know, it didn't matter she was gone. It didn't matter a damn, you know, it didn't matter what was going on with the outfit either. It didn't matter how what was going on next door. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I dived straight into it and I'll tell you the can of the autumn didn't last too long and mm. um mm. <laughs> shortly after that it was alcohol for me and but these are the, this is the reason why we use drugs. They yeah. actually work. And they do work. Yeah. They do work. They, like, they do work. And they keep us alive as well. They do keep us alive. A lot alive. of people mightn't be able to understand that. Yeah. But in, for in the period of time, anyway. They keep, yeah. until, they're, until yeah. they nearly kill you. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I know for sure. I, I, I know this for sure. Had I not dived into alcohol and drugs, I would have, I would have been dead yeah. by the time I was 18, 19. I, I know that for sure. I definitely would. Because there was too much going on up here. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't deal with it. Uh, Alcohol became my drug of choice very quickly, and I I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I dived into it, and I couldn't get enough of it. Like from the from the word go, from the first time I drank, I remember what I drank as well. It was a small bottle of Harp, 
uh, down the fields with the lads, last bottle of harp. Uh, and it was like, I don't know, it was like, it was like an energy came into my body, you know, um, and the pain stopped. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I got another one. And then the following night, I got a flag in the cider, glass bottle of Bulmers, uh, two litre, I think it was three or four pints in it at the time. Mm. Um, and the next night, and the next night. Mm. And uh, it became something that I'd done. And by the time, by the time I was 15, I was drinking every single day. By the time I was 16, I needed to drink in the mornings to function. Um, and it was that quick for me. It was like, it was rapid for me. Um, it wasn't about socialising for me. It was never about that. It was never about kind of having a bit of crack. Uh, it was about stopping the pain inside me. Um, and that's why I make the statement that I would have mm-hmm. I would have took my own life. There's mm-hmm. no doubt. Had I can it, relate had to that. Yeah. I can relate to it all. Would you have been working back then as well, Mick? I When I left school, I went to work in this uh, factory, this steel factory. Um, and that was kind of the path. You left school and went into the yeah. steel factory. and mm-hmm. You stuck it as long as you could. Do you know, it was like a concentration camp, to be honest. And... Yeah, I was there for a while and then I went and I served my time to be a butcher for a, a little bit. But I could never be consistent. I could never turn up mm-hmm. when I was supposed to be there. And yeah. I worked in the petrol pumps for a while. Um, but by the time I was 15, I was unemployed and no ambition to work either. Do you yeah. know? Um, I'd gotten into that routine of staying up all night. Do you know? Um, I remember Prisoner Cell Block H came, used to, was on the television at the time. And I used to watch that, like, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, nighttime television was starting, you know? Mm. And I'd be on my bin watching that and getting up at three o'clock in the day or four o'clock in the day and trying to scrounge around to get money and mm. beg, borrow or steal. And, and that was a full-time job. It was a full-time job, you know? Drugs came into it afterwards. Weed, speed, uh, acid. I loved acid. Uh, LSD. Um, what is it about acid that you're like, don't uh, I- don't get me wrong, I took acid lament many times, but it's not something that I would like yeah. go to every week, you know, I was like, yeah. take that and then I fucking touch him that again for about two years. <laughs> I think it was the hallucinations that really kind of It's heavy, I, like Yeah. Like a, <laughs> I remember waking up in a wardrobe one morning, you know, after acid and, and uh typical behaviour. Yeah, really, like yeah. <laughs> like crazy stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy stuff, but but as Timmy said, it done the trick, you know what I mean? Mm. It really did. And um, The thing about the acid I didn't like was that, yeah, you'd have a crack and it's grand, but then after about four or five hours, like, mm-hmm. it's getting a bit old, you know what I mean? <laughs> and there's still about four or five hours left in it. <laughs> and, and to look at acid, what these days they're using it to, to actually help people. Yeah, yeah microdose you know? and stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, right. It's, it's amazing how... Like they started it back in the 60s and then it was... Mm. It was they sidetracked it because of... Um, the, the trouble that it was causing, yeah, you know, right. and uh, now they're bringing it back in and they're doing tests and stuff like, yep. and they're saying that it can help people with, with certain mental yeah, health issues. That's right, yeah. yeah, that's right. You know, it's amazing. Crazy, right? isn't it? Yeah. Crazy, yeah. Um, I think the feelings that I'm remembering that comes with that time for me is uh, there was a deep sadness in me, a deep loneliness and sadness. And uh, I often thought, like, if if it was to make a film of my 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 act of addiction, just would be very boring, like you know, mm. it really would. Like mm. it'd be, it'd be sad and miserable, you know. Um, just lost, completely and utterly lost. A lost soul, kind of wandering mm. around the place, you know, looking for excitement. But there was always something else happening over there. And if I was in this pub, I needed to be in the next one. And never relaxed, never could. Yeah. Even when I had money, and even when I had enough to carry me, still not happy. Do you know what I mean? Still. Mm. And then the transformation from from being a quiet, sort of private, kind of reserved sort of fellow to being a loud, aggressive, kind of uh, full of shite, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, Jacqueline Hyde, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just uh, horrible, horrible. How did it come to a head for you then? Came to a head. Um, I ended up in treatment when I was 16. Uh, my father put me in treatment when I was 16. I stayed three days, broke out through the toilet window and legged it uh the following two years you know between 16 and 18 all the court cases came and the cells came and the criminal record came a fairly long one as well um and when i was 18 i was involved one night and i'd robbed a car and i'd crashed it into another car and i broke myself up um and i could done thousands and thousands of quids worth of damage and it was a neighbor's car that i'd robbed um the whole place was after me uh I was prosecuted and uh, ended up in court. And um, 
I got handed down an 18 month sentence uh, to Mount Joy and um, something happened in the courtroom there that I've never seen happening before or since is that the judge suspended the sentence on the basis that I go to rehab. I didn't ask to go to rehab. Mm. The solicitor didn't ask for me to go to rehab. Whatever he's seen, I don't know what he's seen, uh, but he's seen something. And uh, What year is this? 1991. 1991, yeah. He knew if you went to Mount Joy as a young man, that was it for you. Because yeah. the heroin epidemic, yeah. HIV, every, yeah. he yeah. was giving you that chance and fair play to him. Yeah. Mm. You know, that would have been the end of you, like... Oh, it probably would have been the end of me. It probably would have been. Um, I ended up in Asher Reed Treatment Centre in Wexford through the courts. Couldn't yeah. leave this time. Um, went in there terrified, like rattled, completely and utterly rattled. Uh, it was the first time in years that I probably went a day or two or three without a drink or without something. And um, my hands were shaking physically. I was in physical withdrawals, mm. certainly in, in psychological and mental withdrawals as well. Uh, Really didn't want to be there. Hated everyone in the place. Uh, I was the youngest in the place probably by 12 or 13, 14 years. Um, and uh, something happened to me in there after about two weeks of that. Two, two weeks of resisting everything that they wanted to do with me. Group therapy. I'd go in and fucking just sit there and not say anything, you know. Uh, like complete stubborn and kind of a, an attitude about me. And after about two weeks... A change came over me, which I think I can only describe today as some sort of a spiritual awakening. Mm. Um, I began to see that it might be possible to live without using. It might be possible. Not that it would be possible, but it, there, there was a glimmer of hope there somewhere. Um, I had the same experience in St. Francis Farm. Did you? I literally, mm. one day up there, right? I was in treatment now a good few times yeah. and in prison and stuff like that. But kind of... The, the idea of being sober or being in recovery, but really deep down, I knew that yeah. there's no way I can, I didn't have the belief I could actually go about my day yeah. without using drugs, you know. Yeah. I never really believed it. Up there one day, it just dawned on me, it was like, you know what, I actually don't want to use anymore. And oh. that, the obsession was gone. Yeah. And it was literally one day, I just realised, I was up there, and the boys were fucking stoned in the detox, you know, because fellas be coming in with drugs sometimes. Like, I didn't want the drugs. I didn't want my first time ever refusing anything like that. Jesus. And it was like, fucking hell, from then on, the obsession left me, like, and yeah. they call that a spiritual awakening in, mm. in A and in A, you know. Yeah, that's right. And um, you can't say that it's not really, like, because, you know. But well, what is a spiritual awakening? It's a shift in thinking, isn't it? Yeah. But you know what? It's, not every, it's an awareness. It's not an awareness. everybody gets it, yeah. though. Yeah. And I feel yeah. fucking so blessed oh. that that obsession mm. was taken from me. Me too. Me mm. too. I, I hate to think, I hate to think what it would be, what it would have been, what it would have been like for me to leave there and go back using. I, I wouldn't have lasted too long. Mm. Really, upstairs was gone. Mm. Gone, gone completely. I hated myself. I hated I hated the way I looked. I hated the way I felt. I hated the way I dressed. I hated everything about myself, you know. Uh, like, at the end of at the end of the using and drinking, like, I was walking around with clothes that hadn't been washed for weeks. Um, I was wearing other people's clothes. Um, I had cornflakes boxes in my shoes. Um, I discovered that if I put cling film on the cornflakes boxes that they lasted longer. Um like what a what a, a position to be in, like really, you know. Um, pure poverty, like like mm. serious, like you know, yeah. serious. Uh, there I were tough on, times back then too, weren't there? Mick? Yeah, the finance the for people, the families, and people the were really struggling. Like. Yeah, I signed on the dole at the day of my eighteenth birthday, um, and I remember the dole. We used to get forty two pound on the dole, and uh, got to the stage where. You know, after a few weeks, I was going to the pub on a Tuesday and I was giving them the 42 quid that I had drank the previous week. Do you know what I mean? Um, horrible place to be. No, it's mm -hmm. nice. It's just, when, when you're in that cycle, it just seems like there's no yeah, way out. And th this is what my life and this is all I'm destined to yeah, be. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And yeah. you've no self-esteem. Yeah. Or low self-esteem yeah. and confidence and self-worth yeah. yeah. based oh. on the estate you've come from, the school process, the family and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But... You went to treatment and it was the makings, yeah? Yeah, it was the makings, me, no doubt about there, no doubt about that. From a fellow who didn't want to go in there to a fellow who didn't want to leave. When my time came to get out of there, I would have I would have happily signed the contract to stay there for the rest of my life. Isn't mm. it common enough that people yeah. go to treatment for the wrong reasons and get it in there? Yeah. I have a friend, a close friend of mine, he went to treatment because he had a load of charges yeah. and he saw over seven years. Right. Do you know? Mm. He was in yeah. there and something clicked in there. Yeah. 
you know, and yeah. fake it till you make it. You fake it till you make <laughs> it, is right, yeah. Um, coming out of treatment, um, coming out of treatment was probably, oh, there's no doubt about it, the early recovery for me was the hardest time of my life. Um, mm. 18 years old, I thought my life was over. I really did. I really believed that my life was over. Um, I started going to meetings. Um, I remember going to a meeting. I came out just before Christmas, and I remember going to a meeting on Stevens' night, my first Christmas clean and sober. Um, and the lads were the lads in the meeting were going to a dance that night, not not a rave, no, not a disco, a dance, right? And they all asked the, all the ladies over here and exactly, Jackson here. Exactly. <laughs> so They're showing your age, you know, Oh Jesus! <laughs> they felt sorry for me, you know, and they asked me, "Did I want to go?" I'd nowhere else to go, so I went with them. I remember going to Artlaw to this dance, and like. I was horrified when I went into it. Like, uh, so it, it was that scene. Mm. You know, the women on one side and the lads on the other side. There was an old fucker playing an accordion up there, like really badly. Like, uh, and there was an old one playing a keyboard, stale sandwiches with turkey on them from the day before. And like, I said, let me say, Jeez, is this it? Like, <laughs> you've, like no, you've no alcohol and you know no, for the confidence. No, yeah. nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, this old one made a beeline for me across across the room. She came over and asked me to dance. You know. And uh, I said no, and and she kept at me like you know, and I wish that the ground had have opened up and I would have jumped into it, you know. Oh, so I I taught me, I really taught me life was over. I really did, you yeah. know. Um, I remember the Sunday nights going home after being at a meeting, um, walking past the pubs I used to drink in, the smell of the pub, you know, the lads would be outside, the music, you know, the atmosphere, and I'm 18 years old going home at half ten at night, you know, uh, and I'm getting up the next morning. With nothing to do, do you know? Yeah. Um, and the cycle just continued. Um, do you know for any young person that I just said I throw this in there now because I think it's very very important? Because when I was eighteen as well, the same age as you, I actually I, I was actually just out of treatment the same, and I actually felt like I was way too young, way too young. Yeah. But for any young person that is watching this you now, um, and they're saying, "Sure, I'm eighteen, I can't give it up." No my life is be over, I won't be able to talk to women, yeah. you know, I won't be able yeah. to do this or that, yeah. you know, like you're, you're a complete example of somebody that gave something up at that age, alcohol, drugs, mm. and have, how, how has your life changed? Well, it's changed dramatically, <laughs> like, it really yeah. has, like, um, when did it all change, your thinking and stuff like that around your life is over and stuff? I think one of the most important things that happened to me uh, at that time, after about six months clean and sober, um, and in recovery, doing my best, but still in a heap, um, I went to Core Town one night with a couple of lads, and um, I met this girl in Core Town, right? <laughs> I, it was a Friday night, and... Uh, I moved to Tala to live with her on the Monday. Um, fucking sure, so, so. fucking lovely lads <laughs> together. <you know? laughs> but what it what it done? Like it was crazy. Like it was absolutely nuts. Like you know, nuts for me, but nuts for her Benny as well. Right? Wasn't that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I arrived in Tala on the Monday, and uh, but that changed my life. Getting out of Wexford changed my life. To be mm. honest, it changed the scenery, change of environment. I, I wasn't carrying the shackles of 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 my past with me anymore. Uh, and that's really where my recovery started. I met oh. a, I met the kindest man I ever met in my life, uh, in in recovery in Tala. Um, he he was a he still is a comedian, full time comedian. Sean Connors is his name. Uh, and uh, he became he became my friend, you know. Mm. Uh, and he invested in me, uh, not financially, but invested in me with his time. And um, we used to travel. I ended up driving him. I ended up being his roadie. And we used to travel all over the all over the country. Um, he used to work with Joe Dolan and the Wolf Tones mm. and the Dubliners and the Furies and all that, you know. And I was I was into that music. And mm. but the chats we'd have, like we'd go to Killarney on a Thursday night, so we'd drive to Killarney four hours to Killarney. We'd be talking recovery. Four hours back, we'd be talking recovery. Mm. You know, he became my best friend, mm. and uh, he invested in me. And and uh, I remember I used to say to him. He used to always try and get me to set these little goals for myself. Like, what do you want to achieve in recovery? So I had five things I wanted to do. First of all, I wanted to learn to read and write. Um, I wanted to get some sort of transport, a motorbike or a car. I wanted to start my own band. I wanted to have uh, my own place to live. And the last one was I wanted to be happy. Mm -hmm. Right? I wanted peace of mind. Right? 
Um, within about five years, I had every single one of them things. Mm. Uh, progress started to happen. Not about material stuff, but progress started to happen. I went back to, I went back to school, started to learn to read and write. I used to do literacy classes. Um, and this is a person who thought I, I, I thought I was tick. I really did. I thought it was stupid. Um, I remember going in, starting reading like kids' books and stuff, and trying to write, trying to write sentences, trying to spell things. And the woman that was teaching me how to read and write, she noticed very quickly that I was dyslexic. Um, I didn't know that. I'd never even heard that word before, being mm-hmm. dyslexic. And uh, so she'd done a test on me, and and you know it was found that I was fairly severely dyslexic. Um, and that really helped me, you know. I wasn't stupid now. I was dyslexic, you know. Exactly, yeah. um, um, I went after a couple of years of that. I ended up in in college uh, in Minute University. I I had always been had an interest in, in youth work. Youth workers along my journey had really helped me. Had really helped me, and they were the people who were telling me to come back to the project the next day when other fellows were telling me not to come back. Do you know mm. the values of youth work? You know inclusion. Mm. Um, empowerment, you know, participation, equality. I, I experienced them values, and I loved, I loved that idea, you know. So I went and done full time diploma in youth and community work, and I done really well at it. Um, I started to work as a volunteer then during that time in St Michael's Youth Project in Inchicore in St Michael's Estate, which at that time had the highest population of intravenous drug users in Europe. I know, time. I know St Michael's Estate because my grandmother was from, my father was from Inchicore. All right. And they have a lot of family in Inchicore and Bulfin Road, which Bulfin, is just, yeah. just down the road. Yeah. It's much quieter now, but yeah. I know Michael's Estate yeah. and yeah. It has had a mad reputation it, at the time. Well, I worked there right bang in the middle of that, and that was my baptism of fire into, into youth work as such. Uh, a few years later, I started there as a volunteer. A few years years later, I ended up managing the project there, going back uh, a good few years ago. It's demolished now. It's gone now, yeah, it's gone now. It used to be called Kyo Square before That's it was right. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael's Estate. It was actually just it was actually the place where the the leaders of 1916 were brought before they were marched down to Kilmainham Jail. There was an army, British army barracks at that particular time. The history there is, is on, I love history as well. But I remember the, as a child, we were walking down, I think it was Emmett Road. Yeah. And uh, with my dad, myself and my brother Keith, we mm. were only kids. Mm. And uh, this guy snatched a handbag from a woman, right, and took off. And my dad took off after him. Did he? Mm. He ran in to say, because it's there. My dad turned around and he says, why don't you go now? He says, nobody goes in there. <laughs> <I'm going> in <laughs> the guy out <laughs> won't even go in there. <laughs> and that's for sure, yeah, that's for sure. Um, education changed my life. No, no doubt about that, you know. I ended up with a diploma out of Minute University, a full-time diploma in Newton Community Work. Um, I was the only person I knew that had been to college, you know, no, there's certainly none of my family, none of the community I grew up in, none of my friends, nobody had been to college at that stage. Um, and I, I, I later discovered that I found myself in what they call it in being in a state of incongruence mm. where I was caught between so, two social classes where people viewed me in a particular way, but I was still affi- affiliated to working class culture and working mm. class people. And I used, I, I noticed when I went home, my old lad would be down there bragging that I was in college and, uh, I was like a pariah when I walked in then, you know, uh, where people didn't, oh, he's full of himself, you know, yeah, that type of thing, yeah, you know. Yeah. So caught in, in that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I ended up working as a youth worker then in Ballyfermot, and I've, I've done all the spots in Dublin, Ballyfermot, Ballymun, Inchicore. Uh, and uh, finally, I ended up uh, managing a youth project in the Curragh Camp in Kildare, in the army barracks, um, where my father had been stationed uh, years before, uh, and my uncle as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was there for about 10 years, managed that project. And uh, eventually I, I ended up doing little bits of work on the course that I had done. Mm. Um, I went back and done a degree as well, and then went back and done a master's. And, um, both, both in youth and community both work? Both in youth and community work, yeah. Um, so we ended up doing little bits of teaching then on the, on, the, on the course. I remember they asked me to teach the youth work module on it. And I thought they got the wrong guy. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I said, like... Imposter syndrome. Yeah. Without doubt, like, yeah. you know... Uh, I was just saying, I was saying to Mary, the other, I think we were talking about it last night, like when I started teaching first, I used to stand at the board and the technology wasn't as great back then as it is now. Yeah. Uh, you used to have to write things down, you mm-hmm. know, on flip charts or, or whatever. There was, uh, it was the, the old, uh, what do they call them, fucking things, where the old slides that you used projectors. to... Yeah, projectors. Yeah, projectors, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you used to have to write them and uh, like the shame and embarrassment in me was unbelievable, like not being able to spell words yeah. and, you know, all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But anyway, long story short, really, I suppose, um, I found, find myself today that I've been lecturing now for about 17 years. Um, I love what I do. 
I love yeah. it. I absolutely love it. You know, every single day when I wake up in the morning to go to work, I never wake up and go, oh, Jesus, I have to go in here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a great place to be. It really is, you know. It's yeah. a privilege to be able to do it's it. It's amazing, amazing transformation. Yeah, unbelievable. Brilliant, yeah. isn't it? Like to be illiterate yeah. into yeah. your adulthood and then to be lecturing. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it just gives a lot of hope as well for people that are out there. Because I know Timmy, yeah. Timmy had dyslexia too. Didn't you, Tim? Did you, Timmy? Yeah. I found out when I was thirty six in college in third level education. Jesus. Um, I went through the prison system, um, and I would have done the equivalent of the junior sort. And worked my way up into third level education, and I finished uh, an honours degree in construction management. Just, mm. just uh, may have gone last year, um, but I, I would have been quite similar to yourself. I, I knew there was something there as well. I just couldn't grasp words and and different things in the way I read. You know, I just didn't fancy it, and um, did an a, an assessment in the college, then an educational psychologist, and um, they told me that I was dyslexic yeah. as well. Um, and it helped me as well, yeah. like it helped you. It just it confirmed that I wasn't stupid or anything like that. I just had this disability um, yeah. and I had to figure out my own way of learning. And by that stage, I had my own way of learning, yeah. you know. Um, so um, it never stopped me. And and just to say to anybody else that's out there listening, like don't leave it stop you either. Yeah. And you can... You yeah. can relate to that too. Oh, without a doubt, I think... I, for, me, for me, education is... Mandela said it, you know, education is the most powerful weapon that working class people can have, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, they can't take it away from you. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't be got at, you know, it can't be taken. Once you have it, you have it, you know, that awareness of the world, that idea of uh, James Connolly is, is my hero. Uh, I really look up to, to Connolly and the way he lived uh, and the principles of his life. Uh, very interesting man. Oh, mm -hmm. man, he's a very complex man, but mm -hmm. so interesting as well. Like, obviously, people know Connolly from his participation in the rebellion in 16, but there's so much more to him, like, you know, mm -hmm. um, the unionisation of people, you know, socialism, the, the mm -hmm. idea of um, living his life on socialist principles, um, the idea of equality. He was a feminist, yeah. you know, long before, mm -hmm. you know, not that it's popular yeah. to be a feminist now, but even long before the idea of feminism came to Ireland, he was the one, like if you look at the um, the proclamation uh, to the Irish men and women, like yeah. Con Condi was responsible for that. Mm -hmm. No no question about it, you know. Yeah. Um, what about so, um, Paulo Freire? Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. The, the idea of the, the banking method. Yeah, uh, and the, he, Paulo Freire is... Um, he he um, rolled out a literacy campaign across Brazil yeah. to mm -hmm. mill millions upon millions. Like the pop population of Brazil now blow your mind. Like, mm -hmm. but uh, he made it his business to get them all literate, yeah. that they can read and write because yeah. they didn't. Because when you can't read and write, you have no um, agency in terms That's of right. voting or participating right. in, uh, in yeah. citizenship. So how do you how do you get people to participate? Yeah. To get the basics, the reading, right. and the writing, and he'd be. Um, they were, I did the community work in UCC and the bachelor's degree there and uh, Paulo Freire would have been prominent across all the, yeah, nearly all the modules and he's yeah. a big impact on youth community work. Right? Yeah. He um, he was an amazing man. He he came up with this idea that, you know... The critical pedagogy. Absolutely. He said that all education has an agenda but you need to pick the right agenda. Mm. Do you know? Uh, he had this idea that the teach the teacher is the student and the teacher and the student is the teacher that it's not this old kind of traditional idea of education where me as a lecturer that i contain the information and my job is to fire it at you and hope that it sticks mm. that you can't learn life experience mm. you can't learn that idea of participating in something you can't learn that idea of uh, of actually being there and feeling so the idea of knowledge feelings and skills really in in academic education we concentrate on knowledge you know, mm. we miss out the feelings piece, mm -hmm. knowledge, feelings, and skills. You know, uh, he, he did another very famous saying then, um, which is relevant today with the geopolitical climate mm. at the moment with Trump and all that. Don't oppress the oppressor. Yeah, he's like it'd be like he'd look at Trump and he'd say, "Don't oppress him. Like don't riot against him or get involved with his fucking followers." And because do you know what? They have the clue. That's they, right. They are. Yeah. That's just the way yeah. that head is, and how you how you counteract that is through dialogue, mm. through debate, not fucking becoming an oppressor yourself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, like, because sometimes um, I spoke about this. Do you know Noam Chomsky? Yes. I know I was kind of getting yes. a little bit. Yes, no, I do. Yeah, moment, I do. Yeah. Noam Chomsky is another American philosopher, yeah. and he said when Trump got elected initially, that the Democratic um, supporters they were the exact same as Trump supporters because if somebody was driving down the road with a Trump sticker. 
the Democrats were smashing their windows. Yeah, yeah, it's that, crazy. And yeah. He only got more support, and that's an example of mm, yeah. oppressing the oppressor. You just become a part of it, and it helps mm. kind of perpetuate the whole thing. It's that discourse that's that's created. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the, the hegemonic yeah. discourse that's that's created. It sounds like we're doing battle here, James. But I know, not, yeah. but we're not. We're <laughs> not. Myself and Mary, they're trying to figure out what you're on. <laughs> <laughs> we're sitting here saying, "What's going on?" I know. That's just the human yeah. yeah. community. It uh, is, yeah. Yeah. But it you is, know, yeah. what? I just want to bring it back there to something you said there about you know the working class people like ourselves you know, yeah. whatever you know one of the, the, the biggest phrases that we use as people is I can't do that yeah. mm. no, I, I'm not able for that you know education is not for me that's yeah. another one mm. that is so wrong yeah you know because like in my circumstance you would have probably said that as well at once upon a I time have, yeah, I, I've have. said it James you did yeah. you know it's not that we can't do it. Some, it's just that we've never tried it. We've never gave ourselves a chance to try it. Yeah. But you also have to want it as well. You do. I, you, I think there's you know? a systematic thing in Ireland at, at, a, at a broader level, a systematic thing in Ireland that kind of, like if we look at the, the current education system, so there's so many secondary schools in Ireland today that don't offer a full leave insert. Mm. Right? They just offer an applied leave insert, right? Um, and it's no coincidence that most of them, or I'd say all of them schools are in working class communities, right? So what kind of a statement are we making? What kind of a statement is the state making around, are we saying that working class people are stupid and they can't, mm -hmm. they can't attain that level of education, right? Um, so it's a systematic thing that, that exists there as well. I was reading a report going back some time ago about the increase, the increase of third level participation in the, in the community of Ballyfermot in Dublin, right? So it had, it, it, there was an increase, the headline was, that education participation at third level has increased by 10%. But the starting point was 1%. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So now we're at 11%. Yeah. Whereas if you look at some of the other communities, like you're at 80, 90%. Mm. Do you know what I mean? The community mm. where me and Timmy is from, um, it's a great school. They've mm. got a great principal and I know some of the teachers up there. And I don't like the Irish Times school feeders table that's released every yeah. year. Do you know, it's a list yeah. of schools and mm. how how many is going on to third level, but the, school, the area where we're from, zero, and it was the only school in Cork that had zero. Zero? Yeah. Zero, yeah. Now, it's not that nobody in the area didn't go on to, did, nobody from that school, because a lot of people send their children to Blarney, because Blarney's yes. not, not fair, yes. and they send them to other schools, you know, but just for the, for the, for the children that's left in there, yeah. um, they'll go on and they'll go to uh, further education colleges and yeah. stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we we can relate with that as well yeah, with Bally Farmers yeah. and, yeah. and all that. Yeah, I think um, I think the idea like I watch so many people come into recovery now. Like I think uh, a lot of a lot of people who are younger now coming into recovery, and I think Timmy said it earlier on. Like you'd love to be just able to explain to them mm -hmm. and and enable them to understand like what's possible mm -hmm. in recovery. Do you know what I mean? The sky is really the limit. Like, mm -hmm. like so, as I was saying earlier on, I wanted to be, one of them five things was I wanted a, I wanted a, a band. I wanted to start a band, you know? Um, and uh, I started a band about 12 years ago. 12, what's the name of the band? The Druids. So uh, we play a lot in Cork, an awful lot of Cork uh, over the years. Uh, we started out life as a rebel band. Um, over the years, we've kind of calmed down a little bit. Uh, <laughs> We got rid of a lot of the anger and calmed down slightly, but uh, we kind of see ourselves as a folk band, but we still play some rebel songs and stuff like that mm -hmm. as well. But we've gotten that band, uh, and actually the unique thing about the band is that all of us are in recovery. Mm. That's Every fantastic. One of us. Yeah. Every one of us. Even yeah. the roadie is in recovery, yeah. you know? So we travel the world in a, in a genre of music which is kind of famous for being drunk and falling all over the place, yeah. and, and we're the opposite, you know? The angst don't know what to do with us at all. They don't know what to say to us, you know. Uh, yeah. I remember don't fit the stereotype. Yeah, yeah. We went to Germany one time, and um, not Germany, Denmark, Denmark. We were in Denmark one time, and uh, like we were brought down to this green room, and like the fridge was full of gargle. Do you know what I mean? Like they were expecting the Irish fellas, so they stocked up. Do you know that type of thing? And we were trying to tell them we didn't drink uh, through broken English. They kind of got the idea. Um, but it's possible to do that. Mm, yeah. It's absolutely possible to do that if you create the conditions to mm. uh, to do that, you know? Yeah, it's like myself today, and mm. I don't have any friends really that aren't in recovery. Yeah. I just surround myself with people in recovery. Do you know mm. it's not, I'm not against people that 
drink and take drugs. I don't yeah. want, you know, some people can do it yeah. and they can still have good families and yeah. good jobs and all that. I can't. Yeah. Um, but I prefer to be around people in recovery. I feel yeah. safer. Absolutely. And yeah. it, that sounds like a perfect scenario for yourself. You still have the music and all that, yeah. but you don't have the madness and the drinking. That's right. Yeah. No, it's it's brilliant. I, 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 I pinch myself sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Where mm. uh, the, the the last obviously ten months has been difficult on that front, and mm. we were away in the states uh, on tour last March and we ended up having to come home and we really haven't played since then at all mm-hmm. um, so it's been it's been tough now it really has been mm-hmm. tough but look that's the way it is except but you're, you're going to uh, close us out with a song here aren't you or a tune in here I think I am yeah do, do. Yeah. drive on there when you're okay. ready alright <coughs> green grows the lily Right among the bushes all A gentleman was passing by He asked for drink as he could try it Well below the valley oh Bring rose the lily oh Right among the bushes all There's one of them by your uncle John At the well below the valley oh Two of them by your uncle John At the well below the valley oh Bring rose the lily oh Right among the bushes oh me cup is full up to the brim and if I was to stoop I might fall in at the well below the valley of green rose the lily of right among the bushes of If your true love is passing by he asked for drink as he got dry at the well below the valley of green rose the lily of right among the bushes of Hey. You know I haven't played Every for ten months. Every time you get up and start dancing, <laughs> yeah, it's like a battle, it's like a battle, play, isn't it? Yeah, there's well, something me. about the bow run and Irish right. music in general. Like I said it here a few times, but it just make the hairs in your neck stand up. There's no doubt. You, you know you're Irish when you react to it like that physically. It's but in our soul, James, isn't yeah. it? It is. It's, it's part of our roots and our heritage. Yeah. And for hundreds of years, that it couldn't be that out of us. That's right. Thousands of years, even. That's right. Just that's what the Irish people done back in any times of famine or whatever yeah. they just. Yep. Yeah, do you know to stop right. the hunger and that's right. The penal laws. Yeah. We were talking about the penal laws on the way yeah. down, and we yeah. were uh, uh, we were just saying like that the music during the penal laws in the seventeen hundreds went underground, and because it went underground, it survived. Mm-hmm. You know, it really did it, and it blossomed and it became stronger as well. And I think that's why the Irish identity across the world uh, is like we meet people in America. We go to these festivals and play in America, like and. We're probably the only ones that's not dressed in green at them, you know. Um, mm. But that I- Irish identity is so important mm. to particularly Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, Americans that probably never have been in Ireland, yeah. but they want to hold on to that identity. And I believe that comes from the penal laws of, yeah. of that identity be, and the culture being suppressed and yeah. try to be eradicated and, and so yeah. on, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. most yeah. definitely. But look, I really enjoyed listening to you. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a great podcast. I really enjoyed the... Um, your story is very powerful and it gives a lot of hope to people that are out there in addiction, people with literacy problems that think that their road, road is mapped out for them. Um, and for anybody going to college, I know in UCC mm. and CIT, there's plenty of supports there for people with literacy problems. I can imagine oh. may not have access programs. Mm. Without doubt, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so if anybody wants to get in contact with you, how can they do that? Um, the best way is through our through the band's website I think so thedruids.ie and, yeah, uh, we'll you, link that in our description on the video yeah thedruids.ie and yeah. Uh, the next time the rules are in Cork give us a show I will indeed mm-hmm. and we'll be out there yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Yeah. I'll just finish up on this um, I just want to just say like your story just shows how somebody that's young 18 years of age can really have a really good successful life you know with, even with no education they can go and get educated make something of themselves start a band just live life and get up every morning and, and, and know that they're going to a job that they like and enjoy and love doing, you know. And if, if there's any parent out there or family member and they have a young person that's struggling, I think this podcast is is very, very important to show it to a young person yeah. and show what can happen, that their life isn't over if they give up alcohol or drugs, mm-hmm. you know. It, it's not it's not going to be an easy process, you know, um, there might need to be some outside help and air and air. Yeah. There's loads of services there. Yeah. We've all used them. Um, and just watch this podcast because um, I think it's it, it will help an awful lot of people. Yeah. 
I think this is probably the best time in years mm. to actually be a young person in recovery. Yeah. It's well, not the end of your life, it's no, just the start it's only of the it. start of it is right, you know. Yeah. And uh, finally as well, lads, could I just say that I've been mm. I've been listening to your podcasts over the last while. Um I think the service that you're doing for people is unbelievable. Um I don't know if you just realise how powerful mm. it is. Uh at times I'd be driving I'd be driving home from work or whatever and I'll stick on your podcast and whatever it whether it's Lynn, Lynn Ruan or whether it was mm-hmm. Seamus was it Seamus the, the, Seamus, Kelly, yeah. Seamus Kelly or or no matter who it is you know mm-hmm. just even to be in to be in the car driving and people are talking about recovery or they're talking about struggle it's just it's just amazing and I really really hope that you just continue it and uh, mm-hmm. and it's been an honour to be here today thank it really has much. so thank thanks lads thank you, thank you very speak. much for your kind words and um, thanks to Mary yeah thanks yeah, Mary. 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 <laughs> Mary and the decks yeah. Yeah. yeah Rowan couldn't make it today yeah. so um Mary is Mick's friend, <laughs> yeah. so we're haunted that you brought her because we'd have been screwed otherwise, but she done a great job with the producing, and uh, thanks Mary, thanks Mick, thanks Timmy, thanks and everyone. everybody, we see you all uh, next week. God bless. See you later. Okay. God bless, bye bye. <laughs> Alright. I think it was only one time that I kind of went, I went away fairly spotty. <laughs> <laughs> only one time. Only one time. <laughs> that was great. That's, that's, that's a great, great uh, show. Thanks, um, lads. Mick Willem. Well, fair, play play play. fair play to you, lads. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.